Hello, welcome back to Disco Elysium. It's me, a Stan, and I am searching now through this place to try to find... Oh, maybe this is the right way. Yeah, to try to find where that voice was coming from before, and I've a little bit lost track of where I am um, in this building since it's been a couple days, so let's take a look around. The floorboards creak. Shoes in a puddle of melting snow. Oh, somebody's been here recently. Take all. La Delta S1? I should probably level up. I have three points. I could level up. Oh, I think I just realized on the left it shows all of my current bonuses. Ah, haha. <laughs> Yes, I am observant. Okay. The sunlight has made this postcard almost completely sepia-toned. Midtown traffic passes. Overhead, the ghosts of skyscrapers disappear into beige midday mist. Vapor rising from the delta on which the district was built. The postcard is prepaid. Interesting. wonder if there's going to be a point to these postcards. Oh, maybe you're the voice. This tray is full of dice. Colorful polyhedral dice. Hundreds of them. Oh, I don't know what that would be like. The candy dispenser has been repurposed to contain thousands of dice. Oh, that's brilliant. Hello, I'm Nia. A bird-like woman sits on a throne of tools with emerald light shining through her hair. Did you try knocking on my window? I must have missed you. I've been listening to my Melius. She taps on her headphones. So what kind of die are you looking for? Um, She's got a direct view to the backyard. You should interrogate oh. her about the lynching. I absolutely will. Hold on, what do you mean by milieu? Yes, a milieu is like a call-in station. You need a two-way radio to access one. That's why I have these. She pats the headphones on the table. Mostly, they just teach you to swear in different languages. But some of the stations can be quite interesting. I was so absorbed, I must have missed you knocking. I don't feel like her voice is the same voice then. She would have, if she were the person that I had called to, yelled to through the furnace, she would be referencing that. So this is someone else. Yes, you must have confused me with someone else. I haven't knocked on your window. Then how did you get inside? By the south entrance? You know what? It doesn't even matter. What matters is that you're finally here. Let's talk dice. Did what? you have something specific in mind? <laughs> Why are you asking me about dice? I'm a novelty dice maker. Tell me the name of your role-playing system and I'll make the die you need. That's why you're here, yes? Role-playing games? You know the one made by Fortress Accident. Does that count? Hmm. I mean, I am a police officer and I do need to ask questions, but listen, in real life and in games, I will ask about some dice. Very good. My rate is 10 real per set. Oh, damn. Unless you want something really unusual. Take a look around and see if there is any particular stone you want to use. The walls around her are covered with rows of precious stones and minerals. It almost looks as if the stones and dice are a natural part of the room, growing out of the shells like stalagmites. No falsehoods are present. She's a novelty dice maker and doesn't have anything to hide. Ask what you need. How did you become a dice maker? How did I become one? It was a business decision. I was a regular jeweler at first. But that's an unfocused field, with too much competition. Some of my friends were role players. They asked me to make some polyhedral dice out of cobalt. That was my first order. I grew it from there. Do you like role playing games yourself? Not especially. I like working with rare materials and a steady pay. And role players as customers? They're nice people. And they always want more dice. Some of those nice people have big bucks to spend on novelty items. That makes sense. Alright, what do you know about the man who's lynched behind the whirling in rags? Nothing really. I didn't know him. The lieutenant looks at his notebook. Then, the woman under the light.
large window. Your window looks directly onto the courtyard. You're saying you didn't see or hear anything unusual last Sunday evening? She's probably going to say she wasn't here. I'm sorry, detective, but as you know, mm. I usually have my headphones on when I'm working. It shuts out most of the daily ruckus behind my window. What do you mean by the daily ruckus? Well, there's always something going on in the whirling's backyard. She stops to try and come up with an example. Listen, just tell me it's Kuno. I get it. During daytime, there are usually those yep. kids. And lately, I've been seeing a lot of drunk workers hanging about. Must be because of the strike. She's heard of the murder, but did not see it, sire. <laughs> I love how drama is so dramatic. Sire. But I never saw anyone during that fateful Sunday night, I'm afraid. Hmm. You never took your eyes off the work to look out the window? I might have, but in this case, all I would have seen is my own reflection staring back from the darkness. Now that's a good point. It's light here, but dark in the yard at night. It's really hard to make anything out in the yard when it's dark outside. Besides, I rarely get up to look out the window when I'm in the zone. Do you often work Sunday nights? It's an odd profession, making dice for people. But I like it, and I prefer doing this to sitting at home. Hmm. I see. Thank you for your answers. She nods. Anything else, officer? Where are we anyway? What is this place? We're inside the chimney of an old central furnace. It's strange, I know. She looks at the ruddy bricks that make up the walls. Even though they've been repainted there, there's still signs of coal black soot here and there. But when I arrived here, all the other rooms were taken, so I had to build myself a makeshift home. Besides, I don't really have to pay any rent here, so that's a plus. <laughs> that is a plus. Creative. The lieutenant looks around the spacious room, its ceiling fading into shadows above. When she arrived here, there was no room anywhere else. She must have known the other businesses. Oh, interesting. Um, I've heard the place is cursed. Do you know people call it the doomed commercial area? I've heard the stories, but I don't think those stories are true. As the wind howls in from the furnace shaft above. <laughs> Plaisance is the one who sent me. She's convinced that the place is swarming with malicious energies. Plaisance, the bookshop lady? I've heard that her business is doing rather well. Have the energy spared her somehow? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it isn't doing that well. There are hardly any customers, and she has to exploit her own daughter to keep the company going. Oh, right. But it's not just the bookstore that's still up and running. What about the whirling in racks? Some people say it's part of the building complex. Huh. <laughs> oh, that's funny. The waitress just took off and customers have trouble paying bills. That's just us. That's just that's just Harry. Hold on, the whirling is part of the doomed commercial area? You could say so. Both houses were built at the same time and under the east of the Commerce Central project. Hmm. I'm gonna say it doesn't look like it's cursed. And then there is me. She sighs, looking at her messy work table. All kinds of tools lie there scattered, from knives to carving files to wire cutters. I've been here for 14 years, selling novelty dice to role-playing enthusiasts. Not exactly a million real business idea, yet somehow I've survived despite the talk of malicious energies. Strange, isn't it? Maybe it's just because she's so talented that she's been able to rue the curse. Hmm. I'll be the first to admit there are many inconsistencies in this so-called cursed. Um, Plaisance does think you're the source. But she's so nice, I don't want to tell her. Um, I will say there are many inconsistencies. I was just about to ask, what do you think? Do you think the curse is real? Oh... Honestly, I'm still not sure. This world is a puzzling pit place. Is it now? I've always thought it's a rather mundane and boring place with no supernatural surprises inside. Well, 
If you ever find a way to explain all those inconsistencies in the curse, let me know. She turns back to her work. That's all she has to say on the subject. She's been thorough and truthful, as far as we can see. Oh, interesting. Oh, my shivers are low. But I could try it. Well, I'm going to ask about this first. Do you know what happened to the other tenants? Everyone else is gone. More or less. Are you interested in anyone specific? Oh, quite a lot of them spring to mind. Uh, the hair salon? Yes, I think it was called Androgynous Orlando or something similar. They weren't a big hit around here. Turns out that working class men don't like genderless haircuts. They're scared of that word. <laughs> a bit of experimenting every now and then isn't bad. Agreed. It's not about the haircut. It's about the confidence. Uh, what's wrong with a bit of experimenting? The customer should have been more open-minded. I guess it just wasn't the time yet. She tucks a strain of hair under her headscarf. What about the gym? It wasn't merely a gym. It was Artemitev's boxing club. A community project created to steer at-risk youths away from drugs and crime. Hmm. Who was Artemitev? A kind man from Zemsk. I heard he had some trouble with the law when he was younger. And that's why he wanted to start the gym, as his way of giving back. Maybe that's what Kuno needs, a community-centric boxing club. Hmm, Kuno. Who's Kuno? <laughs> He's a little ginger gremlin who likes to defile dead bodies. Oh yes, you mean the kid with the sailor's mouth. Yes, I've heard him yelling profanities in the backyard. She looks out the window. It's oddly quiet there at the moment. Oh god, what is Kuno up to? It's like a... I don't know. It's a very small child, right? When you don't hear anything. It's when you get worried. I think it would take more than a gym to help that kid. How did the uh, community project work out? It didn't. If anything, it made the youth situation in Martinez even worse. Oh, no. At some point, someone started a rumor that the punching bag downstairs was full of amphetamines. It's not really full of that. No one would store their drugs like that. Eventually, the coalition took away the funding and the club went bankrupt. This was a few years ago. It's gotten much more peaceful around the plaza ever since. It's with the broken windows. Oh, this one's a mess. There used to be a company that promised to repair windows 24 hours a day. What could go wrong with this one, right? Turns out, the business was actually set up as a front for an illicit group that was producing snuff milieus. Who would have guessed? Hmm. Hmm. What's the snuff milieu? I mean, I can guess. And they never cleaned up the debris either. Now it's just littering the hallway, and I have no idea how to get rid of it on my own. <laughs> cool, very cool about the debris. What's a snuff milieu? It's a Sub Rosa radio station that broadcasts real murders with real victims. Some people pay good money to get off on it. Oof. Nothing changes in her tone as she says that. As if it's just another piece of information to lay out for the world. Don't worry, the ICP has a separate division that deals exclusively with unlicensed sub -roses. This isn't our problem. Okay. Good luck with that. It's not easy catching those perpetrators. Did someone here make stuffed animals? I saw mounts lying around. You mean Mr. Fabron, the taxidermist? No, he mostly just did drugs. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Creepy mannequins? There used to be a fashion atelier here. But I have forgotten the head designer's name. They were doing well for a couple of years until the insect rights activists came. Insect rights activists? Mm-hmm. The atelier produced a certain collection that used chitin among the materials. Apparently chitin is made in the Occident, where it's extracted from beetle wings. And you know how all kinds of political movements are big in the Occident. The activists shut down the biggest chitin supplier, which of course caused the price to skyrocket. And, naturally, all the most fashionable tastemakers refused to be seen in chitin from then on. The atelier went bankrupt before they could finish the collection. <laughs> hmm. 
I mean, I like insects. I'm glad someone took care of the little guys. Hmm. Really? Anyway. <laughs> she looks at the windowsill where a dead fly is lying on its back, legs curled up in a bow tie. Uh, the rotor blades and skis? They were made by a company called Slipstream. After they pivoted from making rotor blades to skis, their chef executive took off on a vacation with all their money. She rests her chin on her hand with an impish smile. Whoops. Honestly, I think it's quite funny. I think he's still sending out holiday transmissions from Tulula or Tiumotiri or Hashkor or wherever he is. <laughs> Interesting, what do these transmissions say? The usual, I imagine. That he's been thinking up all kinds of new business plans and can't wait to get started on them just as soon as he returns. Her smile widens before she sees the lieutenant's face behind you. Men like that are a curse. The lieutenant is stern. <laughs> she just thinks it's funny. Sure, but Slipstream is history now. All their remaining assets got seized by the bailiffs in 47. I have no idea why those skis and blades are still lying around in the house. Not much use now, I guess. They were just the props. Why return them? Hmm. Maybe you could make a sword out of one. <laughs> no, wait, forget it. It would take too long. Oh. Why would I need a sword? Except, I mean, I say that, but like, why would I not need a sword? Okay, I found a strange machine. Fortress Accident, the radio game studio. She closes her eyes as some remnant of a memory lights up her face. They were an interesting bunch. We talked about role-playing systems every now and then. Once, I even saw two of them get into fisticuffs over Wiro. They certainly took their work very seriously, even if they seemed to be chronically liberal with their schedules. What do you mean, liberal? What happened? The usual. They ran out of money and couldn't get the project done on time. My favorite thing about the novelty dice maker is that clearly she just loves to gossip and she never has anyone to gossip to. And here we come along ready to hear all the juicy bits and she's just so excited to talk about it. I mean, low key, not like she's like visibly excited, but she's so happy to share all of this. What went wrong? Well, I did hear them talking at times. She looks at the hallway as if she could still hear them chit-chat behind her curtains on a cigarette break. They seemed to believe they were historical individuals on some grand quest. She sounds almost mocking when she says that. <laughs> they must have been on a gigantic ego trip. That's what I thought. Because when the money started to run out, they just began to complain a lot about capitalism. You know, how the markets are rigged to keep up new businesses and so on. In the end, they just didn't get it done. They didn't have enough willpower to produce something truly historic. And to show up to work on time. <laughs> um, It's too bad. I would have supported them. The project looked great. Not the wisest decision. <laughs> you would have lost all your savings. She tosses a pair of dice on the table. One of them stops near the edge of the metallic desk. The result is one on a 20-sided die. Oof. Critical fail, huh? Anything else? Yes, the terrifying taxidermied bear in the cellar. Oh boy, the fabled Reva show I see tea. You're in for a treat here. She smiles and leans closer, hands on her knees, like a stand-up comedian ready to tell a story. The place was owned by two guys who had some rather innovative ideas about marketing. The bear was one of them. Now ask me about their other ideas. Indeed. What were the other ideas? <laughs> Alright, what about the other ideas? There was really just one. And it involved picking out the prettiest girls in the neighborhood and paying them 20 cents per hour to man the booth. And by man the booth, I mean slump behind the counter with a face that could maim you if you ever dared to disturb their bored magazine browsing. <laughs> she leans back, disapproving. Fritta does the same thing. <laughs> uh, 
I know a girl just like that. She works in Frita as a cashier and she's not particularly friendly. Employing soaky teenage girls is a widespread practice, yes. Unfortunately, they always come in packs. I'm talking about acne-ridden girlfriends and gorilla-like boyfriends loitering near the shop. At least that's what happened with Ravishow ICT. And they already had the bear. <laughs> she closes her eyes as if remembering something painful. What about the bear? The bear. She repeats, pressing thumbs to her temples like trying to suppress a headache. It didn't work out? Of course not. The bear was terrifying. No one wants ice cream guarded by a hostile apex predator. To make matters worse, the fridge didn't work too well either, and half the ice cream came out malformed and partially melted. Eventually, Ravishow Ice City lost the price war to its rival, Glass A 5000. Glass A 5000 sold caramel sundaes for only 5 cents a piece, out of regular fridges. <laughs> I could say I killed the bear. You unplugged it. I will... <laughs> Tempting as it is, I'm gonna say the bear was scary. Every time I saw that bear, I felt scared, like it could become alive any moment now. The taxidermist who made it said it was his vision beast. He said he met his vision beast while high on desiccants. Oh no. He called it Megatherian. Megatherian. Sounds cool. Megatherian? Megatherian. A mega wild beast. What's a mega wild beast? It's an imaginary beast that guides you through life by telling you to do more drugs, mostly. <laughs> I don't have a comment on drugs. Understandable. You shouldn't do them. You're a police officer after all. I mean... Anyway, now you know the story of the fallen ice cream empire. She seems almost sad, finishing the story. Some dust beams swirl in the afternoon air. Her eyes follow it idly. Little sparkling embers under the window. Anything else? Another failed business, perhaps? I've been here for a long time. I found the building's intercom, but it's not working. Oh, right. I hope you didn't try to ring me. I did not, because I don't think I was brave enough to press any of the buttons. <laughs> she rubs her forehead. Her scarf has left a faint line on her dusky skin. I think none of those doorbells work, including mine. I'm still in the middle of connecting the wires. Sorry about the confusion. You're telling me you have a doorbell there? Which one? The one with an empty name card. It's the last one in the list. Uh -huh. As I said, it's quite useless right now. It doesn't work yet. Have a few more questions about the building? Sure. I'm listening. Um, uh, I had other questions. Good. I hope it clarified things a bit. What else? Okay, this is still low. I'm gonna still do it. Why hasn't her business failed? You feel nothing. If anything, it's uncomfortably warm in here. Oh my god. Start taking off your clothes. You need to. Con I'm not going to start disrobing in front of this woman. I will leave it at that. She has begun to idly clean one of her carving tools with a dirty kerchief. The tool's sharp edge shining in the light of her desk lamp. Okay. I will leave. And then. Let's see. I do have all of these... Where's Shivers? Oh, I see. Hmm. I will level it up. And then... I have a plus one already, so... That's probably why it was eight instead of... Um... Four, or whatever. Three. Oh, it's you again. Are you looking for a die? I am gonna try this again here, but just the once and then I'll move on. Aside from getting naked, yeah. you're not sure what else to do. The building holds no more answers for you. Alright. Okay, anything else to see? I don't think so. Okay, well, that was an interesting conversation, but I don't think she is the person I have been talking to. Let's see if I can find my way out of here. Okay, here's the gym. All 
right, let's see. Maybe that was the voice. That's gotta be. It's gotta have been her. I feel like. Let me look at my. Investigate the commercial area. People say report back to Plaisance. Okay. So I think that was who I was looking for. You're alive and well. Don't keep me waiting now. What's in there? In that dark sarcophagus. The dark sarcophagus paused dramatically. Yes, yes. How was it? Tell her how ghastly it was. You know it's what she wants to hear. It was a charnel house of failed business enterprises leeching life energy from this bookstore. I knew it! Oh, such horrors that have been thrust upon us! She shakes her head. But, what else did you find? Did anything survive? No, of course not. Have you located the... entity? Yes, okay. I talked to the entity you told me about. Her name is Neha and she's a novelty dice maker. A novelty dice maker? Well, spit it out. Why does she need the dice? For some kind of sorcery? Sometimes they use the ankle bones of sheep. Um... I don't think so. I think she's just a businesswoman, but because I couldn't resolve the shivers, I'm gonna say I don't have a way to question the malignant entity further. I don't understand. If you're not sure it's her, then where is the source of the doom? How did she explain the curse? She looks perplexed. The narrative she's built herself, it does need tearing down. Yeah. She's squeezing on the pendant too tight. A drop of blood in her palm. To hell with it. Perchance you ought to just lie, sire. Hmm. Hmm. I don't... You know what? I am willing to blame the taxidermist. The sources in the taxidermist shop became involved in arts darker than taxidermy and brought the void spirits down upon this place. Oh, how horrid! I knew something wasn't right about that place. Tell me, did you find a way to break the curse? Hmm. Alright, I'm gonna say I did it. I did a ritual. It's doomed no more. Of course! I trust my Semenese wards and charms kept you safe while you perform the ancient rites. She looks at you with sudden admiration. All that matters is that the energies are retreating. I can already feel the curse lifting. It will be a long time until we're fully free of it, of course. But still, thank you, officer. Truly, you've brought a better psycho-emanation to this humble bookstore, and that's no small achievement. I guess so. I told you what you wanted to hear. She so badly wants this to be over. She would have believed anything. Yeah. All right, then. All's well that ends well. Should the we return to our ordinary lives? <laughs> the lieutenant turns to you. Farewell for now, book peddler. All right, I've still got my um, flashlight out, which feels a little overkill here. So let's see. I think if I go here... Uh, yeah. Oops, I was on the wrong one. Okay, well that's fine. I don't... Oh, I should hold the plastic bag. In case I see more, um, bottles. But before I do anything else... Wait, what's this? Enormous bulls, worthy of a real man. Oh my god. Hey, guess what? Guess what? Guess what? We are still waiting for a replacement for the bull you sent sinking. I found you a new one. What is this? How are you mocking us? This isn't for Betonk. Oh. Now, now. No need to get angry again, honey. I'm sure the officer tried his best. It's not like there's a bull kiosk here in Martinez. I'm very sorry. It's the best I could find. The best, huh? This isn't even a bull. But fine. I guess you did attempt to write your hooliganism. Consider it forgiven. Yay. Is there anything you can tell me about the rifle? Hold out the antique firearm. It's a Bell McGrave. 4.46 caliber. 
Breach loading. Revachal made. Good weapon. Accurate and reliable. His moves are quick and precise as he first checks the weapon, then aims it at the sea. This man knows firearms. Intimately. This one's inoperable. The bolt spring is missing and the mechanism is jammed shut. Still a beauty. Where did you find her? Uh, in the basement there. Point to the bookshop. I'm not surprised. There are probably lots of forgotten wartime weapons lying around here. Back in the day, everyone had something stashed away. As for the rifle, I don't know what else to tell you. These BM-446s are an antique. No one uses them anymore. The ammunition is impossible to find. Huh. Okay, I can try this again. I'm going to do it. Um, what is it about the old soldier that makes him stand so proud? Still, Damn. all you see is an old soldier refuses to replace his uniform with a civilian attire. Anything else I can assist you with, officer? We still have a game to finish. All right, thank you for your time. Hmm. Okay, let's, uh... Let's go around, I think. Oh, no, wrong way. The other thing I can do... Um, that I haven't done in a bit is... Look at the body. Oh, there's something up there. I don't know how to get up there. Okay, well, I'm not going to stress that. <sighs> oh my god, Kuno's fucking electricity. 20,000 volts. Kuno volts. Oh my god, Kuno. Okay, I'm going to look at the body. The rotting man lies on his side with his eyes looking straight through you. The belt is still around his neck. His body is supine and open to intrusion by autopsy. The lieutenant adjusts his glasses and takes a deep breath. Okay. Oh, I did talk to him in my dream. Tell me, who are you, dead man? The fish lips stay and... silent in response. You must be losing your mind, asking him that over and over. I told you, he is male. 40 to 50, with an athletic build. Okay, so what exactly is a field autopsy? Come on, officer. You know what a field autopsy is. You've done a hundred of them. Have I? What you do know is, at 18.9 kilometers, the dormant shield volcano, Corpus Windy, is the world's highest summit. And the failure of the 38th single, Epui de Saint, to crack the top 20, was the death knell of disco. But... What a field autopsy is, you have no idea. Why don't you know? What use are you? You must have me confused with the Copapedia. <laughs> Who's the Copapedia? I think I need to talk to him. You, sir. You are the Copapedia. Well, damn. All right, clap your gloved hands. Let's get in there. There truly is a time for everything, even for yellow gardening gloves. However, they are lacking hygienically. I suggest you get in there in limited capacity. Uh, I don't know. What do you mean? I mean when I need you to. Until then, I should handle physical contact, and you should take notes. We just fill this in, right? Show them the red field autops autopsy form in your ledger. That's right. Yes. Yeah, we got this. We're smart. Okay, open your ledger at the field autopsy form. The dead man stares in silence. As you crack open the ledger, the bright red paper is covered in boxes and lists describing the condition of his skin and organs in three parts. Above those, an 11 field info form needs filling out first. It begins with... Um... Begin. I... are one. Assistant. That's you. Uh, oh god, write the initials HDB. The corpse is indifferent to your scribblings, just lies there. The next box says... Coroner's case number. KK57. 
dash o eight o three dot o eight one five kk equals kim kitsuragi fifty seven equals precinct fifty seven followed by his date o eight o three and time of arrival o eight fifteen on the scene he's indexed the case after himself not you that's because he doesn't want to bring up the messy question of your initials. Hmm. I I'm tempted to ask. I, I will ask. I I want to just. It's like oh, I trust Kim, but I want to ask him about it. Shouldn't we file the coroner's case under me? Technically, I arrived at the scene before you. And what would that make the alphanumeric? HDB forty one zero eight zero three. Help me out with the time of day, anyone? 10.15. It's understated. Um, I'll do the HDB 41-0803-10.15. Good. Let's go with that. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. Name. N.A. Next. Date of birth. N.A. Age. Hmm. Roughly 50. The lieutenant corrects his glasses. Dry 40. The damage is so extensive, it's better to err on the young side. Hmm, I'm gonna write... Oh... I think I'm gonna write 42. I trust Kim, but the corrects his glasses makes me think that Kim doesn't trust what he's saying. Okay, I'm gonna write about 42. He nods. Okay, good. He's cool with that. Race? Mondial. Fair to olive skin, from the Isola of Mwindi. This is as vague as it gets. You might as well say, whitish. Write it down. The pudgy mess of curdled meat looks neither mondial nor anything other. Sex. <laughs> fucky, fucky! The little monster exclaims energetically. Thanks, Kuno S. <laughs> Male. Pigs, Kim. <laughs> Pigs get up sex! Oh my god. I am I I'm just gonna write mail. We are adults, Kuno and Kuno S doing an adult job. Nor does he look male with his pregnant belly and indistinguishable face. Date of death. We're still going with March fourth, fifty one. Right, O four O three fifty one. What else? Nine. Body identified by is non applicable. Ten. Case number. Is the same as the coroner's case. HDB 41-0803.1015 listens motionless with the cargo belt still around his neck. Only one box remains. Evidence of treatment. None. At least not after the initial examination. What exactly is treatment anyway? Interfering with the body's position or wounds post-mortem. Hmm. Didn't the footprints look like he was carried over? They'd have to have incapacitated and carried him over. This man was more than a match for untrained dog walkers. He places his hand on the dead man's chest as if in preparation. Your central nervous system recognizes this gesture. It's the stations of the breath. Ecclesiastic, religious in nature, a holdout from pre-Delorean burial rites. It takes him two seconds to perform, then... Pre-Delorean? I kind of know what that means now, because that's Dolores Day, before her time as the Innocents. Somewhere in Jamrock North, a small wood shed behind Rosencrantz Row, Lieutenant Nick Feuerbach puts his hand to the chest of a small corpse, no larger than a monkey. It's raining outside. Like drizzle, there is darkness in the shed. Hmm. Elsewhere yet, an obese female sits in a wicker chair, her silhouette ball-like against the window. Outside, Grand Coudon, the day is turning dim for Sergeant Mac Dawson. Hand extended, he approaches to make sure she is dead more than anything else. The building is tall, seven stories wind-wrapped in solitude, most of the apartments are unoccupied. This was a suicide. The other, an accident. The small one. Hmm. So it's like connecting out 
psychically to the same motion happening in other places at the same time. And so, all across Jamrock, Coal City, G-R-I-H, 42 deceased persons found today, 42 stations of breath. We should start the post-mortem. Turn the page. The corpse cannot feel Kim's hand on his chest. It no longer meaningfully interacts with its surroundings. A thicket of boxes and lists on red copy of paper tries to answer why. External examination summary. Clothes. The deceased wears armored boots and white briefs. The make of the briefs is Babrodin, I think. Let's see. He turns the body onto its sign to check the underwear label. <gasps> see, it's happening. Oh my God, Kuno. Babrodin, yes. Inexpensive. Size M. Color white. The disappointment is palpable. The red-haired thing was expecting something more lurid. Write it down. The rest of the clothes have been removed post-mortem by scavengers in order to get to the victim's ceramic armor. Officers are in search of the missing pieces. Removal of the boots is left for processing. It would be clever of you to omit the boots altogether, sire. If you are to keep them for yourself, as you ought to, you have deserved them more than anyone else. When am I gonna get them? Patience. After the autopsy, before the body is taken away, there will be a window of opportunity. After the lieutenant has gone to sleep, I hope this has helped you, my liege. Um, God, I don't, I don't know that I can stomach stealing boots off of a dead man, especially if I have to do it behind Kim's back. I'm gonna write down the boots. The boot has a serial number. It's E50.100.1000. The lines between the plates are in the shape of the alpha numerical. The number is purposefully concealed by the design. Write it down. Tattoos. He stands up, feet planted on either side of the body. The upper torso is covered in a single, continuous tattoo resembling a microelectronical circuit board. It reaches from the right shoulder to the heart. The ink is blue and white. The assistant has a color photograph of the markings to be added to the case files as document A1. The photo is taken on the scene using a triggered mini. Write it down. The deceased has a belt for airlifting cargo around his neck, tied with a hangman's knot. Color, yellow. Length, three meters. There is a buckle on the other end. Write it down. Well nourished, athletically built, measuring 1.8 meters. Generally consistent with age 42. Preservation is good. Ambient temperature below freezing. Interesting, he went with the age I suggested. Okay, write it down. Body hair is light brown. Distribution is consistent with the age. The deceased had male pattern baldness. Hair is combed back, short. Mm, okay, I'll touch the corpse's hair. The hair under your latex fingers feels cold to touch, wet. Mm. Stroke the hair gently. The stench is suffocating. Strands of dark brown hair start sticking to the latex of the glove, like thread of a rag doll's head. Mm. There must be brilliantine in there. He's combed his hair back with oil. Write it down, adding the brilli brilliantine. Lividity is consistent with hanging, albeit faint as noted. The head is congested. Contusions are present on the head, chest, and thighs, consistent with stones thrown post-mortem. Low velocity. Oh, that's a dig at you, Kuno. Fucking low velocity? You think Kuno doesn't know what you're talking about? Velocity was fucking max. <laughs> talking shit about Kuno's velocity. <laughs> yeah, we were. In addition, there are bite marks on the face, scalp, and chest. Consistent with predation. <laughs> I can amend for high velocity like hell I will. Kuno gets nothing from me. Right down. You get your mark. The lieutenant produces a small folding knife. With the other hand pulling on the belt, he starts cutting into the polyester. The stench is horrid. After a while, it's obvious the material cannot be cut. The steel wiring. Ah, there's too much of it. We need to remove the belt so we can get to the ligature mark. You've got just the right tool for that. The chain cutters. 
Good thing we got these chain cutters. Pull out the rubber gripped cutters. Always good to think ahead. Now... He points to the rope, squeezing the dead man's neck. We need to cut the belt to see the ligature mark below. Carefully. With as much precision as you can. See? My pig is gonna fuck his head up! I hope not. No, he ain't. Your pig's a boring fuck! Oh, God. Okay. Look for a good spot to cut. The belt is equally tight around the whole circumference of his neck, swelling over the edges like white bread rising from the yeast. The knot is the weak spot. The chain cutters fit in there. Steady now, like a flower arranger. Two cuts and it should come loose. Okay. Oh, that's better than it was. All right. Oh, fingers crossed. After oh, some deliberation, you sink the cutters into the knot tying the belt together. You squeeze the rubber handles together, sweat forming on your brow. Press down. Snap. The knot is slashed. Another cut and the belt falls apart like a flower bouquet, revealing the dead man's neck and the dark red ligature mark around it. The rope rises to a point, leaving a gap in the ligature mark. The suspension point is in the back of the neck. The lieutenant has kneeled closer, running his finger along the dark red groove, until there's a gap. Hemorrhaging is observed on the skin, above and below the ligature mark. The mark is well pronounced, consistent with a drop from 1 or 1.5 meters. Write it down. Chest is intact. Normal contour. Abdomen is protuberant. Pelvis intact. Genitalia... Oh god, Kuna's gonna have something to say about this. He pulls down the man's underpants. No! <laughs> Let's get out of it, see! Yeah, yeah. I fucking knew it! Uh-huh. Genitalia is male and unremarkable. No evidence of injury. I will write it down and move on. Back is symmetrical and intact. Upper and lower extremities are intact, but asymmetrical. There are combat injuries on the right hand, thigh, and hip. He struggles to turn the corpse on its side. In addition, I see smaller, residual scars, too numerous to count, covering about 30% of his skin. Damn, that's a lot. From wounds sustained over two, maybe more decades, Dispersal and accumulation indicates long and active combat duty. The scarring is extensive, way more than a law officials. Mm -hmm. We have a real museum here. Of battles, wars. Write it down. Last item. Hands. He takes the man's right hand in his, inspects it, then moves on to the other hand. I'm gonna pick up the hand. The hand feels heavy, filled with decay liquids. Like it's ready to explode oh, no. if squeezed hard enough. You're suddenly repulsed. So much so, you feel compelled to drop it. Uh -oh. Hands are clean. No sign of injury from struggling. The lieutenant says as five cold sausage-like fingers slip from your hand. Huh, were we expecting any signs of, of injury? I was. Maybe I'm just not seeing them. Honestly, this stench is making it hard for me to think at the moment. Write it down. Ooh. He That's turns to the all for the external. Well done. What next? Okay. Um, he buries his face in the sleeve of his jacket. Okay, I am going to leave for now because I'm about out of time. And next time I will continue with the internal and the summary, etc. Okay, so that's what we'll do the next time. I'll catch you then. Bye!